Hi, I'm Stephen Gross from the Philosophy Department of Johns Hopkins University. Um, I am the co-author with Jonathan Flumbaum of Johns Hopkins Psychological and Brain Sciences Department of uh, the paper featured in the Brains Blog Symposium. And we're very grateful to the Brains Blog and also, to, of course, to our commentators uh, for this opportunity to have this conversation. Uh, John, unfortunately, is in a different city uh, from the city I'm in at the moment. And so we couldn't figure out a way of doing a split screen with both of us in the videotape. So I'm going to take care of um, briefly introducing our paper. So uh, there are two lines of empirical uh, research that can seem to point in opposite directions regarding perceptual consciousness. On the one hand, you have phenomena um, such as so-called inattentional blindness, with which I imagine many of you are already familiar. So, for example, subjects watch a video of two teams passing a ball back and forth. They're instructed to count how many times players on one of the teams uh, touches uh, a ball. And then they're very surprised to learn afterwards that in the course of the video, a person dressed, a person dressed in a gorilla costume walked out into the center of the court and stood there uh, pounding his chest for a little bit. Um, so a natural uh, reaction to results such as that is to think, uh, wow, perhaps we actually consciously see much less than one might have thought that one did. Uh, it might depend on uh, where one's attention is directed. Okay, but on the other hand, there's this uh, other line of inquiry. Uh, much of it stemming from research done by George Sperling in his dissertation. Um, and these are a variety of paradigms that involve post-cueing of some sort or another. So Sperling uh, showed subjects arrays of letters and numbers for very brief durations. They were just flashed, boom, for a few hundred milliseconds. And the task was to uh, write down on a grid uh, for every location on the grid, um, the letter or number that you thought was there, um, guessing if you weren't sure. And uh, in general, people were able to do at most uh, four to five of the letters uh, that is able to answer correctly um, which letters were there four or five uh, of the time, uh, for, for four or five of the spots. Um, but he felt as if he could nonetheless somehow see all the letters. Somehow he just wasn't able to, when he did the experiment himself, he just wasn't able to get them all down onto paper, report them all before they sort of had vanished from his mind. So he came up with a way of trying to probe whether this was the case. And what he did was, after flashing the uh, letters, he would give a cue, which was an instruction as to which row was the one that mattered. Um, and the cue would come also within a few hundred milliseconds um, of the array, but after the array had departed. So subjects didn't know beforehand which row would be the relevant row. Suppose the, arro the row, the ar sorry, suppose the array uh, contained three rows of four letters each. They didn't know in advance which row was going to be queued, but they knew one of them would be, and they knew their task was just to write down the letters and numbers in the locations they saw for that row. And guess what? Uh, subjects were able to get all or almost all of the letters in such a condition. Well, that can seem quite surprising. How did they do it? And the natural thought is, huh, perhaps they actually did see, indeed perhaps consciously saw, all of the letters as the letters they were located where they were. Um, but there's some sort of bottleneck or inability to report all of the letters. Maybe it's just too much information to make its way to whatever enables us to um, give reports of our perceptual experience. Uh, well, if you think that, then you might think there's a there's a, a result in the opposite direction, but equally surprising, um, or at least also surprising, uh, because it seems that what one has to say is that, wow, maybe we actually uh, consciously perceive more than we know that we're consciously perceiving, at, um, at least more than, more than we're able to form beliefs about and report. Okay. So there's two different views about perceptual consciousness. Oh, what should one say? Uh, Ned Block has been the f perhaps the foremost proponent of the view, the, the second sort of view. And um, in our paper, the main goal was to try to offer an alternative explanation of what's going on in these post-queuing experiments. 
So whereas uh, Ned suggests that there's a series of memory stores of declining capacity, where perceptual consciousness is associated with the first one, uh, but then a only a subset of the of that which you're able to uh, consciously see at that level of specificity is able to pass on to um, a second store, visual working memory. Whereas Ned says that, we suggest that um, current research in perceptual science gives alternative ways of accounting for the various post-curing results on which he relies. So uh, this work emphasizes instead the complexities and difficulties involved in the perceptual system transitioning from the transduced signal to representations uh, and then finally to um, uh, report, or at least finally passing off from perception to conception uh, for report. Um, the complexities involved in encoding into representations and then in maintaining those representations and retrieving them provide ample opportunities for um, omissions and errors of various sorts, and these omissions and errors can account for the sort of performance that one finds in these post-queuing experiments. So, for example, um, one kind of algorithm explored um, uh, for vision is a greedy algorithm, where greedy algorithms will concentrate on one region and make uh, the best put together the best hypothesis they can of what's causing the signal for that local region, and then having done so, hope they can then spread out and get um, um, a global result that works. But they sacrifice accuracy outside of the local region um, uh, in order to have accuracy within the local region. Uh, when it comes to retrieval, an example uh, that we give is the following. Uh, much work uh, in visual working memory um, suggests that the representations in visual working memory are probabilistic. Um, somehow, we, if that's right, somehow we get from probabilistic representations to discrete representations that we then report. And um, in the view of many, though not all, the representations of perceptual consciousness, the conscious perceptual representations, likewise are discrete, not probabilistic. Uh, we suggest that one way this could happen is via sampling of a probability distribution, where the sampling would uh, pick a discrete result with a probability associated with the probability of that hypothesis in the distribution. And this provides, uh, again, ample opportunity for there being error, but an error in proportion to what the distribution of the probabilities are. So uh, that's what we try to do in our paper. We conclude with some speculative remarks about what one should say about perceptual consciousness um, if we're right that these alternative explanations that don't involve positing a um, series of success, a, a series of stores with um, reduced uh, capacity, if one doesn't go that route, what should one say about perceptual consciousness? And uh, we have some speculative remarks. Go read them if you're interested. Um, perhaps uh, here, and you'll see also in our commentary, uh, it's sufficient if we just remark upon the interest in the question. So there's a general question of how to relate uh, information uh, processing accounts of uh, perception to perceptual consciousness. And here's a um, particular version uh, of that question that arises in the light of recent work. If the representations in perceptual processing are probabilistic, representations of probability distributions or densities, um, as this work suggests, then what is the relation between those representations and um, conscious experience, perceptual consciousness, where, at least, of course, to many, at least, at least, um, uh, according to many, uh, we don't have probabilistic uh, content. It's certainly an interesting question. Whatever one thinks of our particular um, speculative ruminations uh, on it. Okay, I'll stop there, and um, you'll see the great commentaries we got from. Um, uh, Ian Phillips, Jake Beck, uh, Nico Orlandi, and Aaron Franklin, and uh, we've tried to say something useful in reply. We, we certainly haven't addressed fully, or in some cases even partially, all the questions they've uh, raised for us, but we hope we've had something uh, useful to say to continue the conversation, and we look forward to seeing you further in the comments section. Thanks again to our commentators and to the Brains blog.